Hey traders, David Frost, My Strategic Forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. This will be a weekend video for the week ending September 4, 2020. It was a pretty interesting week to say the least. So here's what we have on the docket. We're going to take a look around the horn at a variety of different charts and a variety of different markets. We're going to look at the weekly charts. We're going to even look beyond the weekly charts. We're going to discuss whether or not we think there's enough evidence that there's a top in place for at least more of a corrective move. We're also going to discuss how the market works. We'll take a look at what happened today on Friday. We'll talk numbers. We'll talk resistance areas. We'll talk support. We'll talk what is the next likely scenario. What's the likely schematic going forward? Before we really get rolling here... Let's cover a little bit of housekeeping. Monday is Labor Day. The market's closed. We'll be back on Tuesday for action. Everybody should relax and try and enjoy the long weekend. What jumps off the page on the daily chart of the S&P 500? For me, the first two things that jump off the chart are the two candles from Thursday and Friday. We had two big down days Albeit today we had a big bounce to boot. But two big down days from a market that was grinding higher day after day after day. So what did the market do? It actually did what we talked about on Thursday, which is come back to test the former breakout area. Spiked it down a little bit. We put 337.50 on the board. Obviously it could be and is on either side of that. That was a roundabout number. What do the markets like to do? They like to come back and check in at former breakdown and former breakout areas. This qualifies that general zone of 337.5 qualifies as one of those areas. What jumps off the page in addition to all that stuff? How about the 20 period moving average or home base? The market closed right on top of home base. It's actually a few pennies below the official place of home base 342.61 is where home base was on this friday the official close 342.57 we're going to call that a rounding error are there any accidents or coincidences of course not could they have closed it above of course they could but we're not going to take anything away from a few pennies below we're going to say for all intents and purposes they closed on the 20 period moving average here's something else So think back to, and if you were active trading in the market during the day, think back to Friday morning. Here's a 10-minute chart. Right of the vertical is today's activity. The market opened with somewhat of a dead cat bounce. Then they gave up the ghost. So it looked like they were going into the abyss again. In fact, in terms of an intraday move, they did go into the abyss. But look at this. Couple of things. A, if you were paying attention on Thursday, you had 337.50 at least on a sticky note. The other thing is, and you have to go back to the course, lazy e-mini trader for this one, is there anything on the chart that began to give you a full stack? What's a full stack? It's a whole host of reasons why that area, A, is support, and B, the market's finding stability. I'll give you a hint. There are things that are taught absolutely and specifically right in the course that are right off this chart and it's like charts that are taught in the course. They all look the same. All charts act and react the same way. So here, this could be a lesson right from the course. You had a full stack developing. You had a tail candle. You had a pseudo doji candle. You had time is more important than price. You had time on your side. You had something to trade against. On a short-term basis, you had what's called a setup. Let's take it a step farther. Here's something else we know. Markets like to climb up, break down candles to get up toward, if not to, the breakdown candle high. They like to climb down the breakup candles to go test or run a test of the breakup candle low. Happens over and over and over again. Happens every day. All charts, all time frames, doesn't make any difference. So what have you got here? You have an hourly chart where this hour here, the 1230 candle, candle ending 1230 p.m. 
closes inside of this breakdown candle. Okay, so that's a hint. You have a low from a different time frame, and now all of a sudden on the hourly chart, you're starting to creep into the big breakdown candle. See how this works? Now, let's discuss a little bit about the possible schematic going forward. Could they continue to kill the market into early next week on Tuesday? They could. If they do, where are they going if they were to get below today's low? 326 and a half to 327. Why is that? It's the next breakout area down south and a gap. If they're going lower, that general area will draw price in. There's also a 50 period moving average north of that may provide some support, but the better numbers are 326 and a half to 327. What if they don't kill the market into early next week? What if we continue to get a bounce higher? What if we continue to rally a little bit? Well, you have a big breakdown candle. We just talked about those. What's the likely scenario? If they can get into that breakdown candle, for example, getting above the close of that candle, then what are they going to want to do? They're going to want to creep up the breakdown candle. Let's keep something else in mind. If, in fact, they are rallying into early next week, that puts the SPY still above its 20-period moving average. If the market's above all the moving averages, is it still above trend? Is the trend still up? The answer is, yes, it is. What we had this week was a taste of reality. The market doesn't grind up every single day. Stocks don't go up 3, 4, 5, 10% every single day. We talked about it many, many times. It was in the redonkulous. It was silly. It will come to an end when it does. It came to an end. Now that we're getting closer to the election time, which is in the beginning of November, November 3rd, between now and then, we can expect to see a continued increase in volatility. Doesn't mean every day the market's going to be down. Doesn't mean every week the market's going to be down. However, there is likely some more downside before this is all recorded in the books. A little psychology going into next week. Let's say the market is trading up when we wake up on Tuesday. They open up and they start trading a little bit higher on Tuesday. Everybody has short-term memories. Everybody will think the selling is over. The market was overcooked. They just came down real fast. Back to business. Party on. Now that may or may not be the case, but that's what will be the sentiment if we're trading up Tuesday morning. What about the weekly chart? Pretty interesting candle on the weekly chart. What do we make out of that? Well, we could certainly look back in time later on and say, hey, that was a pretty good top. They spiked the old high. They spiked it pretty good. They put in somewhat of a blow-off top, had increased volatility this week, an increase in volume this week. It could certainly make a case that this is going to be a top. Also, looking at the weekly chart, we're still pretty far away from its home base. There's a lot of room, a lot of white space, as I like to say, between current price and its 20-period moving average. They don't have to come all the way to the 20-period moving average, but the likely scenario is they're going to come down a little more or, at a minimum, go sideways and let home base or the 20-period moving average on this weekly chart move up toward price. By the way, is there a specific name for a candle that looks like this? There probably is. Frankly, I don't have a clue. Looks like an important candle. Kind of looks like a bigger brother, bigger version to this candle right here, doesn't it? I'm not saying that's going to happen, but kind of looks like one of those. Let's talk inside the numbers because there's some important stuff in here. Got to keep in mind when the market it gets disjointed. All of a sudden, it's not like it used to be. It's not the market of three days ago. All of a sudden, the volatility expands. They're gobbling up a lot of points in either direction really, really quick. That's not a market for everybody. So what you'll find throughout the notes is kind of soft-toeing into some stuff early on until things cleared up later on. The volume kind of dried up a little bit. The melee was in the past. Then we had a handle on the market, and guess what? Aside from stocks on the move, which we'll talk about later, we had a lot of traders that were participants in the rally. 
So early in the morning, basically the market was poised for the dead cat bounce, but in the overnight session, there was a pretty big spread of 60 points between the high and the low. So it's a pretty good clue that the volatility is still going to be there. Also in the pre-market commentary, we talk about stocks on the move on days like today, and also mentioning that there are going to be some traders with itchy trigger fingers, traders that weren't used to these kind of days, that don't know about these kind of days, they entered the market and they thought the market goes up every day. They're called the weak hands. Everybody in this business has to learn the hard way. Whether they like it or not, it's actually the only way that you really learn the lessons of the market. It's hard to find a trader that's been around a long time, successful in the markets, that hasn't had their head handed to them on a silver platter more than once. So here's a reminder. Cash is a position and another reminder volatility is a trader's best friend the quiet grinding market stinks and that is a technical term let's scroll up in the notes see what was going on and then we'll get back to stocks on the move we start in with some numbers early on you need to know where the market is likely to find some type of or a semblance of support or resistance depending on what's going on we have the phony jobs number, so you've got some numbers on the board. And then another reminder, could be a rodeo for a while. So if you're not into the rodeo scene, you become a spectator for a while. Nothing wrong with that. Moving right along. A reminder, early on at 9 o'clock, we're going to let them go for a while. Let the excitement go. It's the morning rush. We just let them go for a while. You don't do anything right away. Let's check this out at 937 Resistance should be around 348, at least on the first run up. So far, it's the dead cat bounce thing going on. You know the routine again, right at the vertical today's activity. Here's a five minute chart, 348. Guess what? The high right out of the gate was 347.83. Missed by that much. Now, here's an interesting one early on. 345, 345, 40. So we'll just use 345 for argument's sake. I really thought the early indication was going to be some kind of range bound chop shop formation. Here's our chart again. So let's identify 345. Here it is. And they cut through 345, tried to rally back and couldn't even get there and then collapsed. Well, guess what? 345 was important whether they want to believe it or not because look what happened. Right into the end of the day, where'd they go? Back to 345. Moving right along. We had a couple of stocks on the move hit early. In fact, it was more than a couple. You'll see some of them here. We'll go over them in detail after the notes. The market got crazy, and therefore, we're already providing some of those lower numbers that didn't even look like they were going to come into play early on. Forget about 337.50. First, we got to stop at 338, 338.50. The reality was the market was so fast, they just went right for the deal, right for the breakout area and right away from it. Why did that happen? That was the destination. You don't know where the destination is until they get there, becomes apparent as they're getting there. That was, in fact, the destination on either side of it. I'm not trying to pinpoint 337.50. I'm just saying that general zone, the breakout area was the destination, period, full stop. Now, I will tell you that knowing that they do that over and over and over again is certainly helpful to the situation. When the market's that fast, it's more of a guessing game. It's not for most traders. Example, am I trying to catch 20 points in either direction in the ES or whatever you want to call it, whether it's the SPY options, it doesn't matter. Am I guessing trying to catch a nice move? No. The market's moving too fast. When it's moving too fast, the risk is too high. You treat it as a business. When the risk is to the point where it's pinned, like a tachometer in a car, you don't need to play. Take your foot off the accelerator. It's not going to stay pinned forever. It's not going to stay pinned all day. You let them do their thing. Let them settle down. Let them give you the next storyline. There's always another trade around the corner. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. So here's a one minute chart, and this happens to be at 1040 in the morning. The high print was 3377.50. Just a few minutes later, the low print is 3348.25. It's 30 points in five minutes. 
It's too fast. If you're in a position, that's great. You get lucky. But if you're not in a position, you're a spectator moving right along. And here you see at 1030, they'll eventually find a morning pivot. So we're looking for a morning pivot. We know how that works, whether they're trading up or they're trading down many times when they're headed in one direction in large part, not just a sideways market. We're looking for a morning pivot. Sometimes they make a morning pivot, meaning they'll make a low or a high and they'll just go sideways. That's fine. Gives us a clue for what's happening next. You see, once again, 338, 338.50. That's right on top of the 337.50. Frankly, I thought they would get a bounce before 337.50. I didn't think they would do it all in one gulp. And then here, I guess it's confirmed. The bigger picture top is in. Doesn't have to be a forever top, but I think we'll see lower prices before we see the top exceeded. Moving right along. Now here's an awareness. They found the low that was supposed to come in that's the morning low we're talking about. Doesn't mean they can or won't come back down. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. About 340. 340 is going to be resistance if reached. Back to a five minute chart, 340. And they spiked it up a little bit, but they spent some time in and around up and below 340 before pushing higher into the afternoon part of the day. It was resistance for about two hours. And what do we have here? A picture's worth 100 words. We have the thing that we talked about on Thursday night. Now, this picture looks different than the daily chart we've been looking at because we have the benefit of seeing the close. This was put on the board about 11.30 a.m. Did traders have ample time if they wanted to be long the market and believed that that was going to be support? What was support? The former breakout area. We talked about it on Thursday night. Put it on the board at 11.30 a.m. Friday morning. The rest, as they say, is history. 12.18, here's 3.40 again. 3.40 is needed to get the bulls on board. Without hourly closes above, no dice. If they stay below and they can't close hourly above, they'll kill them into the close. Here's your hourly chart. 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Closed above 3.40. One dip down below. That's a little bit of a rope-a-dope. But the tip-off is the close above. How you doing? Take off to the upside. Moving right along. The reason why I'm going over these notes in detail today is because if you're active in the market and volatility is picking up, it's not so easy. You need a tour guide. You need to know your numbers. You need to be able to read the tape. And if you can't read the tape, you need to have somebody on your shoulder that can. Here it is. Above 340 and they're stable. Below and they're not. That's all you needed to know. Moving right along. Now, as the market starts pushing higher, you start putting resistance numbers on the board. 341.60 is the gateway to higher numbers into the close. Back to the five-minute chart. Here's your gateway. As soon as they got above 341.60, what happened? They took off. Two o'clock. If they start to rally, 342.75 to 343 would be a short-term prize on a spike higher target. There's your 343. That was a target. Look where they closed the day. Pretty much right around that number, wasn't it? It was 342.75 to 343, and they closed at 342.61. Just interesting. The target doesn't always have to be the end of the rally, but it's what I can see as a, a number, if you will, that the market will be drawn to like a magnet. Can they go higher? Of course, they can always go higher. But if I can't see it, I can't talk about it. Moving right along. And there you have it. 342.75 to 343 is a target that can be reached today. It was. And then just minutes later, they started to run, and there you have it, target hit, and then some. And that was the ball game, at least for me. What about stocks on the move? Now, look at the column where it says entry hit on the right. Every one of them except one. Now, remember something. Remember from the early notes, the pre-market notes, there's a healthy list on the board. They won't all hit their numbers. We're interested in the ones that do. Some of the numbers might seem far away. Maybe, maybe not. And in the pre-market, they were far away. Some were five, six, eight dollars away. Some were really far, far away. But when volatility expands in the market, anything goes. So what I tried to do today was coincide what seemed in the pre-market like really low numbers in terms of trying to match them up with if they kill the market again. The last thing anybody wants to be caught with is a pie in the face on Friday. 
So I'm certainly erring a little bit on the side of caution with some of these low numbers that I put up on the board. They turned out not to be as low as I even thought they would be. However, they were low enough. DocU, Work, Wayfair, Pins, NVIDIA, Apple, Peloton, CrowdSource, or CrowdStrike, and SE. Let's go right down the list. Here's a five-minute chart of DocU. This one gave a trade right out of the gate early on. Came into the 214.49, and look what happened just minutes later. It was already at 220, almost six bucks. That qualifies for a ride. Any trader that entered the trade at 214.49 was taking profit along the way. And if you weren't, what are you doing? Then, as the market got killed, it came in, but you can see what happened. This was the zone that was, in fact, support. Know thy numbers. Stock closed yesterday at 242. Wasn't even anywhere close to 215 in the pre-market near the open. How about slack or work? Isn't that an oxymoron? If you're a slacker, you're not working. 2857 was the number on the board. You see what happened. It's self-explanatory. It did make a high of 2942, almost a buck. Any way you want to look at it, it's either a base hit or a double in terms of a day or scalp trade. Remember. Look where it closed yesterday. Closing print happens to be 33.65. How do you know that number in the pre-market? It's a good question. Wayfair was a rodeo ride. It almost hit the second number and bounced back over the first number. It didn't hit the second number here before 10 o'clock in the morning. The low is 248.91. Then they pulled the rug out, reversed back. It wasn't an easy trade. If anybody traded Wayfair, it was a rodeo. The takeaway at the end of the day is the numbers work. Intraday, it was a rodeo. So the market goes on a rodeo, the stocks go on a rodeo. That's the way it works. They're interlinked. How about Pinterest? 3343 was the number. There was a second one and never got there. It was 2275. Here's the low at 3284. I say 22, it was 3275. Came close, no cigar. Anyway, reversed. You see the result. It's at minimum of a base hit, if not a double or triple. Case in point, what's the high over here? $35. A buck and a half on a $33.5 stock is almost 4.5% using whether it's the new math or the old math. How you doing? NVIDIA had a little bit of a flush operation going on early on, but you can see the numbers were the numbers. 480, 485 were the numbers, the stock was up at 4.10 by the end of the day. About Apple, it did it twice. It did it first thing in the morning, look what happened. It went right into 116.20 and 14.35, and it ripped higher. Here was the high at 118. So if you did it, your average was 115 and a quarter, and you got a nice ride on Apple. Either way, you can see the result. Looks like all the other charts. Here's the daily chart of Apple. Is this qualify for the most recent breakout area? I think so. Pinpointing the numbers is a whole nother effort. But in general terms, that was it. Peloton, you see it reversed right underneath the third number. Why are there three numbers on the board? Because I can make an equal case three times over that each one of those is the destination. A third, a third, and a third rewarded thereafter. If you're painting by the numbers, you had a Lollapalooza of a day. About CrowdStrike, there's your two numbers, 117.54, 115.60. Turns out it was 115.60 as the market flushed, turned around, went on a rocket ride. The rest is history. We do this day in, day out. Regardless of what the market's doing, there are always opportunities on the board. Come over to check out Inside the Numbers and you'll get a whiff of stocks on the move start on Tuesday. What about Camp IWM? 50 period moving average and had the same rocket ride that all the markets had at the same time. It's all the same market. They're all going to bounce together. They're all going to dip lower together when the volatility expands and you're getting these huge price movements. You're not going to get too many divergences. If there's anything interesting on this chart, it's this. They came into what's really the top of the breakout area. Not really into it, but into the top of it. Should we consider that bullish behavior? For the time being, we could. 50 period moving average, the top of the breakout area, 
not getting too far into the breakout area. We're not going to make a federal case out of that. It's more of an awareness. But they're well below the 20 period moving average now. They gave it up on Thursday, stayed well below it on Friday, albeit the 50 provided support. But below the 20, that is a puzzle piece, and that's on the table. From a weekly chart perspective, look what they tested. That convergence of the 100 and the 200 period moving averages on the weekly chart. Now we talked about this the other day. There's a bullish flag pattern and if that broke down, which it started to break down this week, what would be the safety net? Well, you had these moving averages and the low of the breakup candle. We just talked about that, what, 20 minutes ago. All charts act and react the same way. Weekly chart, five minute chart, anything in between. No difference. They're candlesticks and numbers. That's it. How about the RSP, the equal weight that we've had our eye in of late? Looks like the SPY closed right on top of its 20 period moving average. In fact, this one is over it. 1103 is the 20, 1108 is the RSP. Are we going to make a federal case out of that? No, just thought I would mention it. Should we make a case out of it not getting to the most recent breakout area? Not even close. Interesting. Puzzle piece on the table. That's bullish. That's why we look at a variety of different markets, a variety of different charts. You never know what you're going to find. How about the folks out in Silicon Valley? Look at that tail candle. So it closed above the 20 period moving average after running a pretty significant test all the way just short of the 50 period moving average. Look at the amount of points that were covered in the queues in the last three days. Really in the last two days. The high was 303.50 on the button. The low was 271.80 today. Low, 271.80. That's a lot of points. It's basically 10% in two days. That's a puzzle piece. It's on the table. That's indicative of the top heaviness thing going on. Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Netflix, all that stuff makes the queues top heavy. When everybody runs for the exits, you're down 10% in two days. Think of this as a warning shot, a shot across the bow. Here's another puzzle piece. How about the XLF up today? The financials have relative strength. Why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. A, they have relative strength because they do. Doesn't matter what the reason is. But the other thing is the bond market sold off again, which makes interest rates going higher. It's built in profit right to the bottom line for the banks. That's part of it. Here's the 10-year note. Here's a daily chart. Does that look bullish or bearish? Does it look like it's ready to break out and continue to move higher above these moving averages on the daily chart? If they did that, what would be the next target? How about the gap? If that happened to interest rates, which move inverse to the bond market, what would be happening to the price of bonds? They would be going down. Have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you? Without you, these videos are not possible. That is true and accurate information. We're going to pull the ripcord here today. It's everything I wanted to and intended to discuss. I'm David Frost, My Strategic Forecast. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.